Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's start off in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this morning, for bringing us here to celebrate this Palm Sunday. A Sunday, Father, we recognize the excitement, the anticipa anticipation people had for knowing that the Messiah had come. Heavenly Father, you have revealed to us the full truth in who the Messiah is, your Son, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Father, fill our hearts with the joy and an excitement and an eager anticipation for that time when Christ does come again. Lord, to usher in the new heavens and the new earth, the elimination of all things evil in an eternity, Father, to praise and worship your holy name. We thank you for the hope that we have and that given to us through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. A couple quick announcements this morning. No Sunday school or confirmation classes this week or next. But this being Holy Week, or starting Monday, I guess, being Holy Week, um, no youth group tomorrow night. There is choir rehearsal 6.15 on Wednesday. Monday Thursday service will be at 7 on Thursday. Good Friday service, 2 o'clock on Friday, and then our two regular uh, Resurrection Sunday morning services. Also, you'll find something in your bulletin. Um, what do you have right here is nominating committee for the AFLC. The way the AFLC works is it's not about a hierarchy as a lot of other church denominations might be where they have a synod. The AFLC really more believes then that the local church is the right form of the kingdom of God on earth. And so we have more kind of committees to help assist with the AFLC, but those need volunteers, people that are willing to share their opinions, their talents, their insights with these groups. So basically, if you have a huge ego and want your opinion to be heard always, uh, you want to nominate yourself for one of these. Uh, but what you do is if you are interested, put down your name and phone number and actually turn these into me because I'm, I'm uh, in charge of the nominating committee uh, for the uh, Upper Michigan UP area. So I would invite up now our musical talented ladies to lead us in our opening songs. Good morning. Good morning. That's a wonderful greeting. Let's rise as we praise the Lord this morning on this wonderful Palm Sunday. And if you would like to, you can actually wave your palm branches too as we sing Hosanna. <clears throat>
Christ alone I place my trust. And uh, as we go through these turbulent times, we are so grateful that we have our Lord and Savior to place our trust in and know that he has the power to keep us through the days ahead. Thank you, ladies. Let's join together now in singing our next hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Friends, you may be seated. 
Let us join together now in going before the Lord, confessing to him our sins and relying upon his goodness and promise of forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. Together we read, Gracious God and Father, we bow before you as Lord and Savior of all. We confess to you that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We ask that you would wash us with your blood and make us clean. Though our sins are like scarlet, cleanse us and make us white as snow. We ask that you would separate us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. We will praise you through all eternity for your goodness, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' precious name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us. The promise of Scripture is that whoever confesses his sins to the Lord will receive forgiveness through the faithfulness and righteousness of Christ. God grant that this may be the assurance of us all. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand again for our Scripture readings. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, verses 23 through 31. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. So they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy. They have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. Our epistle reading comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This ends our scripture readings. Let's join together now in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated as together we sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Friends, please join me in a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we could sing your praises. We could confess our sins. We could confess our faith. Father, a faith that is based upon your word and your word alone. Continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, strengthening us in our faith and in our walk with you keeping our feet firmly planted on the foundation that is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. For, Father, it is through him that we have our hope and our salvation. We thank you for this great gift, God. This we pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> so it's Palm Sunday. We are celebrating this day. We get to wave palms and Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. I mean, here it comes. You got the long-awaited prophet and Messiah, the guy that's going to save Israel. He's going to restore it or a former glory. So everybody was so happy to see Jesus. Everything's going to be made right again. But that was the problem, that people were looking for that kind of a Savior. The people were looking for the type of Savior that was going to save them from their temporary burdens, not from the eternal burdens they faced. And that's why so many people can be led astray from the truth of God's word by false teachers because false teachers will appeal to the emotion. They appeal to the now. They tell you what you want to hear. And of course, there's a great cost in all of that when we fall for them. Looking at just some of the earliest church even and some of the struggles that it had before you had the early church, but even going back to the Jewish religion, the problems that happens when we took our eyes off the truth of God's word and we made it what we wanted it to be. For example, you just look at how the Jews all started. You had God creating for himself this nation. He said, you are going to be a light to the world. You are going to point all nations to me. That's what God told the Jews. And the longer things went on for them, the more they drifted from God. Ultimately, it got to the point that they drift so far, God would speak to them to try to warn them to come back to him. And guess what happens? Like all human nature, we say, I don't like what you have to say. I don't want to hear it anymore. In, Jer in Jeremiah 38, there's actually the example of the people saying to Jeremiah, we don't like what you have to say. We don't want to hear it. Here you have Jeremiah being described in his book as being specifically created by God for the sake of telling people the very word of God. And they're like, yeah, I don't really want to hear that. 
I find that very interesting that God could raise somebody up for a specific purpose to give them messages and they reject it because it's not what they want to hear. For example, in Jeremiah 38, this is what the people had to say about him. Jeremiah 38, 4. Then the official said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of his people, but their harm. The message that Jeremiah was telling them was actually the opposite. The Babylonians had laid siege to the city, and God said, Tell your people that if they go surrender now, I will spare them, but if they stay in the city, they will be destroyed. So Jeremiah is trying to say to the people, God said if you surrender now, you'll be spared, and his own people are rejecting him, saying he's bringing us harm. We like to hear what we like to hear. Other problems that the the nation of Israel got lost on her way on was the fact that they wanted to be in control of their own fate, of their own destiny. Remember, God had created the nation to be a light for the world, and what happens? They turned it into a social club. No, this is just us. We're not a light to the world. We are just God's chosen people only. In order to do that, then, they created this radical form of legalism and nationality. This nationalism and legalism drove everything where they would isolate themselves from everybody else and they would put such suffocating rules on people that Jesus even condemned them by saying this to them. In Matthew 23, Jesus said to this, starting at verse 3, So do and observe whatever the scribes and Pharisees tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Here you've got people that are supposed to be teaching the word of God, building people up, and instead they're crushing them with these burdens that they themselves won't even follow. And then, of course, Christ comes, and now we have a whole new take on this. We're trying to learn what Jesus is teaching. And at first it was a little bit hard to understand this, and so you had all of these different heresies coming up in the church. Because it would have been hard to understand. You've been following Judaism all along, and then God comes up and he gives his son to die for our sins. That's a tough message to understand. Why would God die for our sins? And so as they're trying to understand this, there's all these different kind of teachers coming along the way. And at one point in time, the teaching of Arius was so prominent that they figured the Roman Empire was about 50-50 splits on which way to go. And so Emperor Constantine actually mandated, you guys go have a council and figure this out, because what Arianism taught, well, if Jesus is the Son of God, then that means that he was made from God, and if Jesus was made from God, that would mean that there is a time when Jesus wasn't. All of a sudden now you realize that Jesus would no longer be eternal. He would be lesser than God, because he was created by God. That would be a wrong teaching, but the early church had to decide on this. Other teachings that came up at the time, Gnosticism, it was this this adaptation of of Greek philosophy and this, this seeking out of like a secret wisdom or knowledge that the universe has in it, and they've allowed that to infiltrate the early understandings of the church. And part of the issues that the Gnostics had was that they believed that all that's physical would be evil, all that's spiritual is good, Well, how then could Jesus have come down from heaven and been good because then he would have been physical? So they had all these different teachings about Jesus. All of these people trying to explain God instead of accepting the fact that we don't understand the mysteries of God. And then lastly, once the church was established, once there was a canon formed and an understanding of it, you'd think it would have been smooth sailing, but not necessarily. Because at that point in time, what happened was the Catholic Church ruled everything. But the problem with the Catholic Church was, like all things, anytime you give somebody too much power, it takes advantage of that. And so the next thing you know, the Catholic Church is saying their word is equal to the word of God. And if they're claiming they're equal to the word of God, guess who has the most power over all kingdoms? The Protestant Reformation is actually considered one of the greatest moments in world history because it changed how our governments even operated because no longer was one church speaking for God determining how things were going to be. I bring all this up to talk about all the different things that can look like it's from God, but it's actually leading people astray. Please rise for our sermon text this morning. Our sermon text as we continue on with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This ends our scripture reading. You may be seated. So, you know, as we continue on with the Sermon on the Mount and, and going through this, this teaching of Jesus in the book of Matthew, I thought about, all right, well, it's Palm Sunday, next week's Easter Sunday, I'll just take these two weeks off and focus on those. And then I realized, wait a second, Palm Sunday is the perfect week to be teaching on this. Because what happened is the whole nation of Israel celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem, yea, the Messiah has come. But it was the Messiah they wanted him to be, not the one that Scripture was talking about. They let their emotion and understanding and desire for who they wanted Jesus to be cloud them from the fact that that was actually not the Jesus that was entering into Jerusalem. He was not coming to save the city and restore Israel for all her prominence and glory. But don't forget, nationalism had so consumed them for so long that that's what they thought. But you see, friends, when we hear about the Jesus that we want to hear about, the Jesus that we want to follow, the Jesus that suits our passions, that's the Jesus that's going to lead us astray. You see, our hope is not in our version of Jesus. Our hope is in the one true Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, the one that says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's examine this text today, this warning that Jesus gave to us. Because it's kind of a scary warning, knowing that, hey, guess what? You look around, we've got a bunch of sheep. This is all a good thing, and some of those sheep are actually wolves. And it's scary because what do wolves do? They prey on the weak. They destroy the weak for their own gain. And we have to understand there's different kind of wolves out there. There are the wolves that intentionally do that. Oh, they're dressed up as sheep, and they are going to destroy you because that's what they want to do. And then we also have these wolves we have to worry about as sheep that are actually, actually maybe they're even just sheep that have gone the wrong direction. They have gone astray, unaware of it, but they're leading others with them, unaware that they have lost their way. So what Jesus is doing here is giving us clear instruction how we can know the difference, how we can hold a test up to them to understand, are you teaching the right things? What I want to do, though, before we get to that is let's look at Scripture, some different definitions along the way before we get to that point. First off, we have to understand Jesus used the word prophet here. We're going to expand on that. We're going to broaden the word so we don't limit ourselves to thinking that it's just somebody that predicts the future. When we're talking about prophets, what we're going to be talking about today is anyone that is speaking and teaching the word of God. This will apply then to all pastors, all teachers, all YouTube, social media people, anybody that writes book, anybody claiming to speak the word of God, we are going to be holding to the standard today. But again, before we get into testing them, I think it's important to understand them. Why are there false teachers? Why would somebody take something as beautiful as the word of God and twist it up at your expense? Well, let's go to scripture again. If we're going to talk about false preachers. And if we're going to say the only truth can be found in Scripture, then let's let all of our examples and everything come from Scripture today. The most obvious reason why there's false preachers, Paul nails a couple of them in the book of Philippians chapter 1. The verse 1, he says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Pride. That's one of the reasons there's false teachers. Simple pride. Because it is funny, as pastors, we do battle our insecurities. You want to see something funny? Go to a convention of pastors. The guy that's supposed to give the message that morning is bringing his A game, trust me. All right? He's in a room full of pastors. He wants you to know he knows how to preach. And I'm not going to deny it. As pastors, we turn into pouty little babies if you tell us you heard a good sermon somewhere else. All right? Fine. Why don't you just hire them, man? Whatever. Okay? It's true. We do. We get that little voice in the back of our head. But you know, wolves are motivated by other things besides pride. 
Paul goes on in Philippians 1.17, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition. There's those that simply do ministry as a way to make money. Believe it or not, ministry with wrong intention can be extremely profitable. Why? Because there's unfortunately too many sheep out there. There's nothing wrong with pastors making money. There's nothing wrong with some that have been paid well. Maybe they write really good books because God has gifted them to do such things. Jesus says a worker deserves his wages. The problem comes in when a pastor is out there saying, am I building up God's kingdom or am I building up my bank account? There's other reasons for false teachers. Believe it or not, there are those that don't even believe the word of God. They will outright deny the word of God. Instead, they stand up to preach because they want you to hear their own ideologies. I read a couple stories recently. They're absolutely mind-blowing of pastors who are outright self-proclaimed atheists. And they get up every Sunday to preach in the, up in the pulpit. And as odd as that sounds, that's the truth. And Peter warns us about that. In 2 Peter chapter 2, he says this. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. They don't believe the word of God. They don't understand the word of God. So they want to preach what they want to preach because it sounds good to them and that's what you need to hear. Other things scripture lists about what motivates false teachers. As we heard in the Jeremiah, some people just like accolades. So they'll be yes men. Hey, I don't like what this guy has to say, so I'll tell you what you want to hear. So the yes men will gladly get up and tell you what you want to hear because we get lots of pats in the back for doing that. And then finally, the reason, and I think this is the most frightening, most alarming, and most sobering of why we need to be on our guard against false prophets and false teachers comes from this. Paul warns of this in 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 13, For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of the light. Satan is not afraid to try to teach you scripture. He knows this at the back of his hand, and he knows it well enough to know when to leave off a little word here or a little word there to change its entire meaning. Those are why you need to be afraid of false teachers, because they do not have your best interest in mind. That is why they are wolves in sheep's clothing. So how do you protect yourself against this? I mean, now that we're aware that, okay, false teachers exist and they have bad motivation, how do I protect myself? How do I know if somebody is a wolf in sheep's clothing or they are genuinely speaking the word of God for my benefits? Again, let's go to Scripture. Because Scripture teaches us, how do you test these? How can we know the difference? One of the first things we have to do is we have to eliminate our own desires. In order to understand false teaching, you have to eliminate your own desires. 1 John 4, 1 through 2, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So you put aside your own self and you stop and say, okay, is this the message that is proclaiming Jesus Christ? Because as he just said right there, everything that is confessing Christ, every preacher, teacher, whatever, that's talking, maybe using the name Jesus... Is he actually preaching who Jesus is? Are they actually preaching Jesus as the Son of God who came in the flesh to die for our sins, rose again on the third day, ascended back into heaven, sits on the right hand of God, and will come again one day to judge the world and usher in the new kingdom, the new heavens, and the new earth? If they're speaking of that one, if they are speaking of the Messiah that the Old Testament is pointing to, if they are speaking of the Jesus that the Gospels are talking about, if they are speaking of the Christ that the apostles are pointing everybody to, that's who then is in Scripture. That's the right Jesus. 
because anything that does not claim the Christ of the Bible is misleading you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 23, he said, we preach Christ crucified. That's what the essence of all preaching and teaching should be about. It's got to be about Jesus. If the message you are hearing is not tying back into Jesus, there's issues because the whole of scripture points to Jesus. If the whole of scripture then points to Jesus, then all of our teaching should point to Jesus. So Jesus then, going back to our sermon text, gives us instruction about how to judge teachers. You will recognize them by their fruits. So every healthy tree bears good fruits, but the diseased tree bears bad fruits. What are the fruit he's talking about then? The way you judge that is you judge the actions. Are they for the individual's gain? Are they about self? Or are the fruits about others? You think about all the false teachings that I mentioned just to start off the message with. The Jews were led astray. How the Gnostics were leading everybody astray. How the early church was leading people astray. When it was all, all misguided, and all of these had selfish intention behind it. The problem with the Jews was this radical nationalism and legalism took over. It took their eyes off God. Suddenly it was, if it's good for the country, then it must be from God. The Gnostics and heretics lost sight of the mysteries of God. They tried to figure out God and ascertain this secret knowledge they felt was out there. The early Catholic Church conducted itself as if it had the same authority as God's word. All of those, whoever is teaching that is benefiting from that. Those are not trees that are bearing fruit. A fruit tree bears fruit for the sake of others. So what does that tree that bears good fruit look like? Well, what it produces is from God and it's for God. When the Holy Spirit works through somebody, their character, their heart, all of that reflects God. If someone's action is how much money I can get, how much recognition can I get, how can I make life more comfortable for myself, for others, it's not bearing fruit. It's just looking out for itself. You know, even Jesus said, I did not come for my own glory, but for the one who sent me. And so if Jesus points everything back to God, then everything indeed needs to be pointed back to God. So what I want to end this on today is, how do we protect ourselves from all of this? Because the reality is, this all depends on you. This text here is all about beware. What are you going to do with this text? You see, if we know that false teachers are coming in sheep's clothing, that would mean those that follow them are sheeple. It's a portmanteau of the word sheep and people. The definition of sheeple is people considered to be sheep, being docile, foolish, and easily led. I don't think anybody here wants to be a sheeple. The only way you can do that is you have to remove your personal desires from it and you have to know the word of God. The personal desires issue comes from our epistle reading. And our epistle reading this morning I thought was just so great and it's so important for us to remember. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And you know, I hear this verse said a lot about the world. Yeah, see, they're just, you know, going after their own things. This verse is not talking about the world. The world is already off chasing its own teachers. This is a warning to us here in the church. I want to hear what I want to hear, so let's get people to tell me what I want to hear. If you only want to hear from a teacher that is going to make you feel good and not challenge you at all, you are walking a very fine line then between hearing your gospel and your Jesus versus what scriptures call it. Because the word of God pierces the heart. The word of God challenges us and the word of God is not about you staying in your comfort zone. And then the second and most important point of all of this. If all you know about Jesus 
is what you hear from a pastor on YouTube or some blogs, Christian music, or even just me, that's not enough. The whole purpose of this passage is to warn you to be on guard against these types of people that look like they're speaking the word of God, but in fact are not. And the only way you can spot it is if you know how to spot it. By learning the whole of God's word. To understand what it looks like for somebody to bear good fruit. Bearing fruit is a common expression found in scripture. It's describing the work that we are doing for God's kingdom. And so when you understand the word of God, you learn to see what bearing fruit looks like. You learn to see the warnings of how nationalistic zeal can place the kingdom of God and use it as the means to the ends where it's about what our own earthly gain is. You learn to spot heresies. You learn for listen how Christ is being preached and how he's being described. That doesn't fit what scripture says about him. You learn to recognize power-hungry individuals and institutions You learn to understand, are they actually claiming to have equal authority with God? And in the case of your local church, the more you learn about about God, the more you can keep your pastors and teachers accountable. And honestly, it's something we appreciate. Because, you know, Scripture says that teachers of God's word are going to be held to a more strict standard. And so... You're warning us, and you're sharing with us, challenging us, helps keep us as well on track. And so you see, my friends, a warning like this that Jesus gave us today is a warning about you being aware. How are you keeping your guard up? Because you don't know if there's wolves among you. You know, there is a reason, and sometimes some people look at, like, Lutheran churches or other churches, they call them liturgical, right? Right? So we say things like the Apostles' Creed, which was written during the period of the early church. It's been being said for centuries now. Or the Nicene Creed. Do you know the Nicene Creed was written specifically at the Council of Nicaea, which Constantine called together to decide what the Christian faith was going to be, to help get a proper understanding then, to separate between Arianism and what we stand for today. We don't say these things because it's ritual or tradition. My grandparents did. They'd be unhappy if I didn't. We say these things because these are the core tenets of our Christian faith. These are us affirming what Scripture has says and what we believe. We should never just kind of mumble through these because it's just what we're supposed to do. We're actually declaring what we know to be true. And what we know to be true, and I always point back to this and I love this, What Peter said to Jesus when he said, to whom would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Please bow your heads to me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these teachings that Jesus gave to us. The warning to be on our guard, Father, that just because a message proclaims to be from you or about you, that we have to be able to look at it, understand it, and say, is this really teaching what God's word is teaching, or does it just sound good? What is the appeal of this? Is the appeal for my gain, for their gain, or is the appeal of what I'm hearing about building up your kingdom and for your glory? Father, most of all, I thank you that you promised to send us a helper to help us to understand this, to help us understand your word, to help us decipher the difference between what teachings are good and what teachings, Father, are for selfish gain. Lead us and guide us always, Father, to build up your kingdom for your glory, leaning always on the words of eternal life, which are the words of your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Friends, I'd invite you now to please rise and whip out that palm branch because we're going to sing a unique closing hymn today. We're going to sing a Christmas song, but the reality is this Christmas song we're singing is one that we should be singing as we wave the palm branches, realizing we are singing our anticipation and hope of the coming Christ. Let us join now together singing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
I'd seen a pastor mention that he was going to sing that, and I just thought, that's brilliant. Because the concept is, here's people on Palm Sunday, and they're celebrating this earthly king. But we're standing here today waving our palms, anticipating that long-expected Jesus, the Messiah, who's coming once and for all, who will reign eternally. It's not just an earthly kingdom he's promising. It's his eternal kingdom. So friends, let's join together now in saying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.